It is an elegant weapon from a more civilized time. And that time was nearly 20 years ago, when I was filming Revenge of the Sith from 2004 to 2005 as the UK stand-in for Hayden Christensen. That's me on the right. And as a treat for myself, I decided then to buy this Ultimate Replicas Force FX screen-accurate replica of the actual prop that I held on set as Anakin Skywalker and Lord Vader stand-in. Always two there are, working under my stage name of Christian Simpson. No relation to Christensen. Yeah, and that's the lightsaber right there in my hand. Now these are actually webcam stills from when Pablo Hidalgo from Lucasfilm pointed a webcam at the set and you're able to watch the making of the movie from home in about one frame per second. And <laughs> terrible resolution as you can see, apart from a few professional photos that were also taken. I'll share a few more stories and pictures from the set in a minute, but there's one problem with my prop replica. You see, I've been upgrading my editing desk here, and I really want to have the lightsaber powered on all the time, basically as a wall lamp, and to add a cool pop of color to the side there. But there's two problems. Firstly, this model emits a sound while it's on, which is great when you want to destroy some younglings. <laughs> Yeah, but not when editing videos of some soft-spoken YouTuber. And worse still, it turns itself off after five minutes, even if you find a way to mains power it. So let's see if we can hack those features and turn this into the ultimate office accessory for Jedi business. Put the power of the Force in your hands. Put the power of the Force on Perifractic's walls! Welcome. And thanks to Eleven Labs AI for that slight edit to the original commercial voiceover just then. But now back to that original lightsaber that this is all based on. You saw me here lying under a very heavy camera for an insert shot on Mustafar when Anak uh, Lord Vader does a force pull to retrieve that lightsaber and attack Obi-Wan. Mm, sorry about that, Ewan. But I do just want to take a second to share with any fellow Empire Strikes Back fans how incredible this was for me as a fellow fan, because I used to literally dream of being in the Wampa's lair on Hoth and trying to escape by using Force Pull to retrieve that exact lightsaber that Luke went on to inherit. It's still unbelievable to me that I was rehearsing a Force Pull before that story that I used to dream about as a kid had even taken place. It's just... Yeah, it's, it's pinch yourself and you, you still don't believe it. Much like the Wampa, I suppose. So while I'm sharing some exciting stories, here's a few other fun screenshots of a Star Wars fan on a Star Wars set. So what's going on here, you may ask? Well, that's me on the monitor at the top right, lying on the floor in agony uh, because I'm lying in the coal of Mustafa. And this was a green screen pickup shot or blue screen pickup shot. And uh, there's Hayden replacing me. I still remember his loved Vader hand coming down to help me up off the floor as he took my place. Now another day I showed up for work and it said on the call sheet, Anakin leans on a pillow watching Padme. And Natalie Portman walked on set, Hayden wasn't ready, so this was my moment to have some pillow talk with Queen Amidala. I was so excited. Until I realized it was a misprint and it should have said, Anakin leans on a pillar. So there I am, leaning on a pillar next to Padme. Not quite the same, but uh, still fun. Here I am rehearsing a lightsaber scene as Hayden watches and learns. Probably not. But we became friends during the shoot. And this captures, funnily enough, the exact moment that I asked him if he knew he replaced Sebastian Shaw in Return of the Jedi, because I'd heard rumors. He'd heard about it, but he wasn't sure. So he then asked George in front of me, which is quite a moment to watch. And George kind of said, oh, yeah, well, we found something, some footage that kind of worked. So, uh, you know, yeah, we, we used that and you're in there. And the rest is history, as they say, with Return of the Jedi having just hit theatres again with Hayden in that role. There I am trying out the Emperor's chair, as you do. It's quite comfy, actually. And here's me again with Nick Gillard, stunt director, and Ewan McGregor. We're just practicing a lightsaber duel uh, just before Hayden arrives on set. Now this showed up on one of the behind the scenes DVD featurettes and it captures me. Uh, some of you will realize why I've got a Naboo fighter t-shirt on under the Jedi robes there. That was my little way of recognizing Star Wars Episode 1 on the set of Episode 3. And there is Samuel L. Jackson and someone called George Lucas watching yours truly on set with that Naboo shirt showing through. Oh, Ewan, <sighs> ruined the whole thing. We have to stop it now. 
Okay, fine. Before we get on with hacking the force, I will share just one funny story with you. I'll save the rest for another time if you like. Now, a stand-in's job is basically to stand in for the main actor, as you saw, so the crew can set the lights, cameras, and sound up while the actor is in hair and makeup, and occasionally to double for the actor as well. It's an efficient process, and what you see here is George Lucas, Ian McDiarmid, and myself standing in for Anakin, ready to film that iconic Galaxy's Opera House scene where Darth Plagueis the Wise is first introduced. George had come over to us and he was giving us direction. And Anakin comes over and kneels down next to you and you turn to each other and, and, and. Now for me, the silence went on a bit too long and it was getting awkward and I just had to fill it. And so I said, and kiss. Everything stopped on set. You could have heard a youngling drop. Ian stared at me. George stared at me. I stared at me. And then George said, and kiss. Thank goodness, uh, it could have gone very badly indeed. But I lived to tell the tale, unlike the younglings, and later I was used to essentially do the motion capture for the BD-3000 luxury droid on those same Galaxy Opera House steps. Now they said the droid was tall, which is why they needed me, but they didn't mention that I'd end up having big metal boobies. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but you've heard about how the Force binds the galaxy together, right? And very recently, my better half, Lady Fractic herself, filmed this scene for The Mandalorian, which is set at the bottom of those same Galaxy Opera House steps, recreated here in Los Angeles, instead of where I filmed it, Shepparton Studios, London. But isn't that incredible? We both got to work in the same place, nearly 20 years apart, but also 5,000 miles away, yet it's the same place. You get it, it's weird. As they say, a long time ago, in a studio far, far away. Thank you. You might have also seen her doubling for the very naughty Imperial, Elia Kane, in shots like this. Well, back to Earth now. But if you want to read some more stories from the set, I'll add the link to them on StarWars.com to the video description below. And do also check out my Patreon because I'm always sharing behind the scenes stuff and other more sensitive things with the supporters over there. But that is enough reminiscing, isn't it? Right now, it's time to hack the Force. So I've taken the battery compartment out of the handle and I'm replacing the AA batteries with these dummy ones that go to mains power. With that done, let's try and break into the rest of the lightsaber. Thank you, R2. And looking at this PCB, there does only seem to be one microchip, and it's under a blob of painted black silicone. But the PCB does remind me of PCB Way, where you can get great PCBs for all your retro or Jedi needs from just $5, although I don't think they sell Kyber crystals yet. Because as we all know, PCB stands for painting chips black, doesn't it? Well, either way, let's try and find an easier way to bypass that shut-off timer and the sound. The rows of resistors and diodes are presumably for each segment of the blade as it illuminates from bottom to top and vice versa when you turn it off. But there's nothing else here that could be a timer, so it must be in that tiny chip. That's me by my size, do you? <clears throat> but either way, I think there might be an easier way to do this. Now 
And now if we touch that wire coming from the power to each of those separate pins, it does indeed illuminate a different part of our lightsaber. Meaning, if I solder all the pins together and then just attach that one wire to them, it should light up the whole thing, bypassing any timer on the microchip. I did try connecting before the resistors to protect the LEDs, but for whatever reason, that didn't work, and this just does. But what about disabling the sound too? Well, I noticed a moment ago this self-screen word speaker hiding back here, and it connects to this pin that goes straight to the batteries, meaning that pin powers the speaker. So if we simply put some tape over the connection, or power the lights from USB instead of the batteries, either way, it should kill the speaker, and so it will become one with the force, quietly. So now I can ignite the lightsaber at the start of my editing and it will guide me along the way, as indeed it did while editing this very video. Job done. Thanks for watching, subscribe and support below, and cheerio.